Gwyneth Paltrow's ski crash trial is a deliciously ridiculous combination of wealth, celebrity, and courtroom drama. You're not good friends with Taylor Swift. I would not say we're good friends. We are friendly. We've been following every last second and are ready to give you the rundown on all of it, from ruined wine tastings and fangirling attorneys to the final verdict. We'll now have the clerk read the verdict. Plus, we're wondering, what exactly is it about celebrity court cases that everyone finds so alluring? Jury's out. It kind of looked like everybody else on the slope. That's always my intention. Okay. Probably had a better ski outfit, though, I bet. <laughs> it all started in 2016, seven years ago, when Gwyneth Paltrow and her now husband, Brad Falchuk, took their respective kids to snowy Utah so they could get to know one another on the slopes. There, retired optometrist Terry Sanderson claims Gwyneth injured him in what he called a ski and run, while she claims he skied into her. Boom. Here are all the weird and wonderful things we can't stop thinking about when it comes to this epitome of a rich, white dispute with side characters and subplots worthy of a courtroom sitcom. I have brought my children, apple, orange, grape, and pears, to her concert before. Goop founder Gwyneth Paltrow has built a lucrative second career for herself selling her lifestyle, but she's still pretty private and controlled about what she shares, so it's fascinating to catch a glimpse of the extent of her wealthy existence through this trial. And I gave him some amazing Goop Glow Serum. Oh, you're gonna love this. She's arrived in court wearing luxury clothing and jewelry. The gold necklace alone is believed to be worth $65,000. Her glam, sometimes camp, fashion choices have become an online obsession, and she's been described as dressing like Adam Driver in House of Gucci, or a woman from the 80s who's hired a hitman to kill her husband. We're getting a window into how much the goop icon, who's known for selling over-the-top wellness, bone broth diet, body brushing, and the infamous jade eggs, actually lives these eccentric, expensive practices day to day. The fact that you're even talking to these people, like, do they know that you're goop? Do they know that you could devour them for breakfast? Uh, oh, breakfast is like a meal that people usually eat. Deer Valley, where the alleged incident took place, is one of the most luxurious ski resorts in the U.S., frequented by celebrities, politicians, and billionaires. The tab between the four of you for a couple, four kids, couple days, nearly nine grand, eh? That's what they charge. Since the trial started, the jury heard that on the 2016 vacation, Paltrow spent $9,000 on private ski lessons alone. Who do you know who can spend that kind of money on a skiing trip, simply? Obviously, we're wondering if Sanderson sees the celebrity with a rumored net worth of at least $200 million as a target. But it appears Sanderson's pretty rich, too. Although we're not sure exactly how rich. His presence at Deer Valley is an indicator. An old, rich white man on the ski slopes in Utah. Like, I don't know that this could be a whiter crime. It's hard to know who to feel sorry for in a trial where the big headlines seem to be about, well, lots of money. Sanderson complained that he can no longer enjoy wine tastings. He says he's been a self-imposed recluse since the accident, which Paltrow's lawyer countered by providing photographic evidence of Sanderson enjoying dozens of glamorous vacations around the world post-accident. Is this you? Are you in this river cruise, river boat? I believe so. Okay. Um, yeah. Naturally, Sanderson argued that these trips to exotic locations like the Amazon and Peru simply were not enjoyable, and he had only attended them on advice of his therapist, who thought that visiting the Netherlands three times, Morocco twice, and countless other destinations could be a part of his healing process. Meanwhile, when Paltrow was asked about the impact the crash had on her, she said, Well, I lost half a day of skiing. This didn't elicit much sympathy and was immediately parodied hard. Busy Phillips posted a tragic shot on Instagram with the caption, well, we lost half a day of skiing. While some of the trial's followers joked the entire thing must have been written by White Lotus creator Mike White. Um, is, there's not enough bone broth at the trial? Okay, yeah, no, I can sense him over. To add to the borderline surreal tone of the proceedings, Paltrow's team asked if they could bring treats for the bailiffs, given how helpful they've been, a request that was quickly shut down by the judge. We don't know what the treats would have been, but we're guessing goop care packages. Fun. And the hits just keep on coming. When if Paltrow's attorney just caught the plaintiff in a lie that every single 5'5 five five guy has ever made. Do you agree you were 5'8"? Yes. Have you shrunk three uh, inches? I couldn't believe it either. One of Sanderson's lawyers, Kristen Van Orman, has taken a super strange approach in her interactions with Paltrow. I was pretty upset. 
right? You're yeah. small but mighty. Actually, you're not that small. She seems to be starstruck by the actress, giving her compliments, commenting on her clothing, asking about her friendships, and even questioning how much she tips. And I'm assuming, and you're under oath here, <laughs> that you're a good tipper. And remember, she's supposed to be on the other side. Though she manages to bring much of the questioning back to the case, she goes from odd angles. And you're not trained in accident reconstruction. Me? Yeah. No. Neither am I. When she talked about Paltrow's height, she compared it to her own, fishing for compliments on her four-inch heels. We're about the same height? About 5'5 five five with heels? It's roughly. Oh, tell me I'm taller, please. <laughs> We have to question if Van Orman, one of the trial's breakout stars, has Johnny Depp lawyer Camille Vasquez on her mind and is actively trying to cultivate a friendly image where she doesn't alienate the popular celebrity. I'm just a country lawyer here. One of the most fascinating things about the case is how different the two accounts are. Sanderson claims that Paltrow plowed into him and that the collision resulted in broken ribs and a concussion. An incident he described felt like King Kong coming out of the jungle or an attack by Godzilla. I said, oh my. My ribs are so sore, there's just this really deep, throbbing purple pain here. Paltrow, on the other hand, says Sanderson skied into her, and that her initial thought was it must be something perverted, as his skis parted her legs. And then there was a body pressing against me, and there was a very strange grunting noise. There are eyewitnesses to the account, but it's very difficult to ascertain what happened, given that both skiers were wearing helmets and similar clothing, and the main question at hand is who was further downhill when it happened? I was just skiing down the hill when this huge, ginormous, huge lump of lard, fat-ass piece of shit crashed into me. Still, both legal teams have tried to prove their clients' separate accounts with detailed scientific calculations. Sanderson's lawyers called on neurologist Dr. Richard Bone to say that his injuries could only be caused by Paltrow crashing into him. Meanwhile, Paltrow's team called biochemical engineer Dr. Irving Schur, who claimed her account lies with the laws of physics, and Sanderson's witness Bone's measurements were thrown off by incorrect velocity. Sanderson already sued in 2019 for over $3 million, but that quote hit and run case was dismissed by the judge. So he's now trying to take her for $300,000, claiming that her reckless skiing caused him brain injuries. The media has called the $300,000 a relatively low sum given the type of trial. But overall, this is the moment when many of us realize for the first time that suing for bad skiing is even a thing you can do. Meanwhile, Paltrow's countersuing, but for a dollar plus legal fees. This prompted Sanderson's lawyer Van Orman to take another strange route in questioning, repeatedly asking Paltrow if she was close friends with Taylor Swift, who sued David Muller, a DJ who assaulted her, for one dollar in 2021. Are you good Hi. friends with Taylor Swift? No. You've never given Miss Swift personal, um, intimate gifts for Christmas? Uh, Your Honor. Uh Relevance. The implication was that Paltrow was copying Swift, but this isn't a new thing at all. Taylor Swift didn't invent it. It's called suing for nominal damages. For example, Meghan Markle was previously awarded one British pound in nominal damages by the British press. Law Insider defines nominal damages as often being for a dollar, saying they're so that the plaintiff may be vindicated or recognized and not for the purpose of indemnifying the plaintiff for any loss suffered by him. In other words, this is exactly the move anyone would expect from someone like Gwyneth who doesn't need money but wants to make a point. So why was this commonly known legal trope a surprise to Van Orman? Some theorize that she had another agenda. Well, I just want to make it clear for the courtroom, Miss Paltrow, you cannot get me tickets to the Eras tour. Ultimately, the jury found Gwyneth not at fault. What percent of the fault do you assign to Terry Sanderson? 100%. The ruling marked the end to the absurdly memeable proceedings, awarding the millionaire goop magnate her sizable price of a single dollar bill. What amount fairly compensates Gwyneth Paltrow for economic damages? One dollar. Though on her way out, Gwyneth provided one more nugget of hilarity, whispering, I wish you well to Sanderson, to which he replied, thank you, dear. It was a noble gesture from the wellness star to the retired eye care professional who had at last solved their rich people courtroom quibble. When all is said and done, there's one clear verdict we can firmly stand on. Between the countless time wasted for all parties, the plaintiff walking away with nothing but more legal fees, and the defendant skipping home with a buck, it's clear the true winner was everyone watching at home. Was this worth it? Absolutely not. I'm going to be 
on the internet forever. Celebrity court cases have always been the subject of fascination, so why do we focus on them so much? Ever since the first highly publicized Hollywood scandal and the ensuing court cases against Fatty Arbuckle, the public has had an obsession with seeing celebrities in court. The Hollywood 10 trial, which centered on scriptwriters and producers who were accused of being communists, has been the subject of multiple movies. Lindsay Lohan's nail art at her 2010 probation hearing caused more of a furor than the actual courtroom content. The O.J. Simpson trial, one of the most famous in history, inadvertently launched the Kardashian sisters' careers. Remember these words, if it doesn't fit, you must acquit. And of course, the 2022 Johnny Depp Amber Heard defamation case showed that today's audiences are far more interested in this as entertainment than in most scripted dramas actively courting their views. It was peaceful. And then he starts talking about the feces. The celebrity trial has such a hold on us because we get to see what's behind the curtain. Glamorous people whose private lives are traditionally off limits to us suddenly have to become candid about details they'd rather not share. So in the tiniest of ways, we're shown that these gilded lives, which might seem too good to be true, are, if not normal, still imperfect and full of indignities and frustrations. Apart from perhaps Gwyneth Paltrow's, sure, she missed half a day of skiing, but she still managed to make the most of it. I decided to go in early and get a massage. That's The Take. Click here to watch a video we think you'll love, or here to check out a whole playlist of awesome content. Don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications.